Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Raggio, a senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies and editor of FDD's Long War Journal. And this is Generation Jihad, the podcast that covers what used to be known as the global war on terror. Today, we have a special guest. Uh, I don't think we could call you a guest anymore, Caleb. It's yeah, Caleb special Weiss. guest, yeah. <laughs> You're special to me. And, and oh, to thanks, man. Audience. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. But, no, but seriously, thanks for coming on and, and coming on at such short notice. Yeah, Caleb, no uh, he's a research analyst at FDD's Lone War Journal and a senior analyst at the Bridgeway Foundation, where he focuses on the spread of his, the Islamic State in Central Africa. But Caleb is so much more. Uh, Caleb understands Al-Qaeda's network, global network. He understands the Islamic State's global network. He's tracking these terror and other terror groups uh, in multiple theaters. Uh, yes, he does, uh, at Bridgeway, does focus on the spread of the Islamic State in Central Africa. But, you know, Caleb, uh, when the conversations we have offline, um, he just amazes me with his knowledge. Um, so uh, today we're going to discuss a, a new book that was released by Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, and it was written by Abu Huzaifa al-Sudani. He's a veteran Al-Qaeda member, um, and he an ideologue. He uh, calls for jihad in the native Sudan. He published a book on this, obviously. Um, in addition for calling for the overthrow of the Sudanese state, he also gu guides prospective jihadis on how to uh, form jihadist groups, how to wage jihad, how to recruit and preach, all per al-Qaeda's rules and guidelines. Uh, so a couple of things before we jump into this. Uh, this may sound like it's just uh, focused on Sudan, but it isn't. What, what Abu Huzaifa is talking about here is this this goes across you could replace sudan and, and put it in with tunisia or somalia or or afghanistan this is how this is al-qaeda's playbook on how to build jihadist organizations there are some particulars in this book and we'll get into them with caleb uh about how the difficulties of al-qaeda establishing jihad in sudan that is specific but the guidelines that he lays out here how to build the military wing, how to preach to and how to recruit. All of these things is standard Al-Qaeda boilerplate. And another thing about Abu Huzaifa, no one really understands who he's. He's one of these fascinating individuals that, that Caleb and, and I and Tom Jocelyn, who we love, like we love when these guys pop up on the radar. No one knows who they are until they appear. Like we've, we've seen that he's published a little bit here in Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. We know a little bit of details about him. But once a book like this is published, we really see his impact on the organ and his importance in the organization. He's one of the unknown unknowns who becomes a known to us. And, you know, one of the things that bothers me, and I know it bothers you as well, Caleb, is when they talk about El when counterterrorism officials and, and, and experts out there talk about Al-Qaeda and they focus in on a couple of key legacy figures like I, I'm in Al-Zawahiri, Osama bin Laden, Saif al-Adel, the, the, the named individuals that they're sort of in the counterterrorism field. Everyone knows who they are. And even the average person who, who has interest in this will recognize their name as well. But guys like Abu Huzaifa, they're, he is a veteran jihadist. Multiple decades uh, was in Iraq, was in Afghanistan, and we'll get into this. Uh, he had uh, relations with Osama bin Laden. He is a veteran al-Qaeda leader, very important to the network. He may not be uh, a, uh, an individual who everyone recognizes their name, but he's an individual who is very important to al-Qaeda. So let's get into it, Caleb. Let's talk about the background of Abu Huzaifa al-Sudani. Tell us about his history. Right, which I think it's important to start of AQ in Sudan as a whole. Uh, I mean, of course, most people know at this point, I mean, it's standard industry knowledge, but you know, they were based in Sudan roughly between 1992 and 1996. And then around 1996, they were formally expelled, and expelled is in quotation marks, because not all of the network left. Of course, the bulk of the network left, Bin Laden and his cohorts and Zawahiri, they all left back to Afghanistan. But they left remnant cells. But there were still, they still had infrastructure in Sudan, just wasn't to the same scale. Um, and I think this is where, you know, this plays into it. Of uh, You know, for instance, the Guantanamo Bay files, um, they talk about, you know, several 
AQ, you know, recruiters, financiers, you know, whatever, you know, people that were left in Sudan in the late 90s, or early 2000s. You know, clearly, if the entirety of the movement left, they, those guys wouldn't be in place. Um, so Sudan really comes from from those people. Um, and also, just to be clear, for people more familiar with the Sudanese political context, uh, of course, after 1996, international pressure was on Sudan. Hassan Tarabi, the Islamist who kind of led Omar al-Bashir and his dictatorship into this Islamist, you know, frame of, you know, ideology or whatever, he was detained, which then the government of Sudan became less permissive for jihadis like al-Qaeda. So it's within that context as well. Just a reminder to our listeners, al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda had a significant presence in Sudan up until 1996. He was investing in a lot of money in infrastructure building roads and schools and things of that nature in order to ingrain al qaeda so we could see the the investment that al qaeda put into sudan this is something they've done in other areas as they've established their presence so uh, it wasn't just a, a a small cell or a small leadership cell of al qaeda it was a significant investment and and the ejection Osama bin Laden, as he said, put it in quotes, like him being asked to leave the country. That really was a difficult time for Al Qaeda. They had to yeah. reestablish themselves. Yeah, I don't want to downplay that, but just the, the point is that they they left people there. They, not the yep. the entirety of the network did not leave. Um, but on Abu Huzaifa himself, uh, details are a little murky on his early history. Um, it, it's evident that he joined Al Qaeda in Sudan uh, and then followed the bulk of the network to Afghanistan following the quote-unquote, expel, uh, expulsion from Sudan. Um, and it's here in Afghanistan where he actually spent time with bin Laden. Um, in a previous book he wrote, he talks about his time with, with bin Laden, of, of personally visiting him, personally travel, traveling around with him. Um, so if those are true, he obviously had some sort of high stature, uh, enough that you know he spent time with him. On the point of the truth, Caleb, I always take these uh, anecdotes from these jihadists as, yeah. uh, as being very credible, because he could easily be called out, called out by other individuals in Bin Laden's presence. Sure, it's possible that he's lying about this in order to boost himself, and the rest of Al Qaeda is looking the other way. But they take they take these types of relationships seriously, and they would not want someone claiming to be a close confidant of. Now, again, I don't exclude the possibility that he's lying, but I, I put a lot of weight on his claims that he was close to Bin Laden. Right, and just given his history, which you know, following you know this, you know, talking about what he did following Afghanistan, I think it probably leads some credence that he probably did have some sort of relationship because uh, he spent time in the Al Farouk training camp, which was an Al Qaeda training camp in Kandahar uh, prior to nine eleven, um, and it's here where it really gets interesting. Uh, is that Abu Huzaifa was involved in a late two thousand one Al Qaeda terror plot in Saudi Arabia. So this was a plot that you know was ordered by bin Laden. It was overseen by his then military emir, Mohammed Atef, uh, who was later killed um, by a U.S. airstrike. But the plot was still overseen by Ibn al-Sheikh al-Libi uh, and Saif al-Adil. Could be a new AQ leader, we don't know, but he's definitely in the running. Um, but the plot was essentially to go to the Prince Sultan Air Base, which is an air base at that time that was used by U.S. You know, forces, Air Force. Um, that's right outside of Riyadh. Um, based on, again, Guantanamo Bay files, two Saudi brothers who were, you know, initially part of this, but were eventually detained in Pakistan before they can travel to Saudi Arabia. Um, again, like the plot was overseen by these top level Al Qaeda guys. It was ordered by bin Laden and Sudani was part of the team that ultimately carried it out. Um, so he traveled from Afghanistan to Saudi where he personally fired a SAM into the base. Thankfully, it failed to detonate. No one was hurt, whatever. Um, but he, he then fled Saudi Arabia, and this is interesting that he went to Iraq, at that time controlled by Saddam. It's unclear how long he stayed in Iraq, but clearly while in Iraq he utilized you know, Al-Qaeda's network there, which was pre-war. Um, Tom Jocelyn's done a lot uh, to, to look at the pre-war Al-Qaeda network in Iraq. Um, so it's unclear how long he spent in Iraq, but following his stay there, he went back to his native Sudan, where he was initially or eventually arrested and extradited back to Saudi in mid-2002. And then it gets really unclear here, because he spent some time in jail, but is eventually released under shady circumstances. He finds his way back to Sudan, where in 2007 he takes part in a bomb plot um, just outside of Khartoum. Uh, 
By 2012, he's likely affiliated with another AQ startup group in southern Sudan. Uh, not South Sudan, but actual southern Sudan. Um, then uh, by that time, between 2012, 2016, no one really knows what he's up to. By 2017, following the creation of Hayat Tahrir al-Sham in Syria, which used to be known as Jabhat al-Nusra, or AQ's you know, official branch in Syria. Um, he takes part in reconciliation efforts that al-Qaeda was trying to, trying to do um, that was actually initiated and ordered by Zawahri to try to get jihadis in Syria to, uh, again, come together, be a unified front, start, you know, stop their bickering or whatever. Abu Huzaifa was part of that. You know, he, he co-signed statements by various different al-Qaeda ideologues, including Magnisi, Magnisi and Abu Qatada. You AQ, don't just yeah. co-sign agreements, you know, or, or negotiations no. with guy, the likes of Magnisi and, and such without being, you know, that that shows the his importance. So th- this entire biography you've given uh, it shows his importance and his historical ties to top al-Qaeda leadership. Yeah, clearly someone who AQ holds in high regard if he's co-signing statements with Abu Qatada and al Um But after he releases this book, which this book was released earlier this month, um, which to be clear is a collection of letters um, that Abu Huzaifa has written over the past two years to you know, quote unquote, our people or the Mujahideen in Sudan, which is very, you know, generalized statement just for prospective jihadis in Sudan. Um, but following the release of this book, he might have been arrested. Um, Amak DC has come out and said, that's Abu Muhammad Amak DC. Um, he's come out and said that he was arrested in Sudan. Sudanese newspapers are kind of, uh, you know, alluding to his arrest, but Details are kind of murky of whether or not Abu Huzaifa is free or arrested. Either way, release this book, and it's uh, honestly, I think it gives a good look into what Al Qaeda expects of its branches and affiliates, and that's what we're going to jump into. Yeah, and it, to me, this is uh, very fascinating. When, when we look at this book, it's something before we'll, we'll get into this, but I think it shows how Al Qaeda is. A learning institution, how it's self-critical. It talks about what works, what doesn't work. I, you know, I always we we've seen this in communications between the former head of AQAP or Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, Nasser Al Wahashi, and and Drew Dell, the former head of uh, Al Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb, where they're talking, where Wahashi was talking about what worked when they took control of areas in Yemen at certain periods of time. And I think you see a lot of that in with the, with Abu Huzaifa. And uh, that's what I find very fascinating with no, reading it, this stuff. It's very geeky to guy like to my, maybe to most of our listeners. With, but this is how you really get to know Al Qaeda when you get to see how they're thinking. And it's not just this is not propaganda. This is a this is a document that is very I think very honest, honest about what works with Al Qaeda and what doesn't work in particularly in with Al Qaeda's efforts in Sudan. And that's why you have to give a lot of credence to it. He isn't just cheerleading for the group. He's, he's advocating for putting an organization in Sudan that works. And he recognizes the, the very difficult problems that Al Qaeda has in planting the seeds of jihad in Sudan. No, and I think that's the, the key point of this is that. He's critical of what Al Qaeda has done in Sudan. He's very critical of saying that this didn't work. Uh, and there are two cells he mentioned specifically that we'll get into. But, you know, AQ has had a long history since, you know, the quote unquote expulsion of, of trying to foment jihad in Sudan. Um, for instance, in 2006, during the height of the Darfur crisis, Darfur being the region of Western Sudan that's, you know, typically in crisis, um, it, been, both bin Laden and Zawahri released two separate videos calling on you know Muslims in Darfur to mobilize, start a jihad. And in bin Laden's video, he even offered to send foreign fighters from Iraq to Darfur to help them foment this you know jihad against the Sudanese state. Uh, of course the the main Darfur rebels you know quickly rebuffed that. They said we want nothing to do with you. Um, but that didn't stop bin Laden's warfare from releasing two other videos a year later in 2007. Then there was another one in 2009. So you have at least five videos over the course of three years of from Al Qaeda's top two leaders calling for jihad in Sudan. And nothing came of that. Of course, in 2008, there was that attack on a USA diplomat and his driver that so they were murdered, claimed by two shadowy organizations, Ansar Tawhid and Al Qaeda in the land of two Niles. 
Uh, of course, those are the only attack, you know, that's the only attack claimed by those two organizations. No one really knows the history of them, who they were, what they became, whatever. It's very, very murky. And that's kind of Sudan in a nutshell. Um, there's really no historical scholarship on AQ in Sudan post-1996, um, which gets into the Sudanese state. I mean, under Omar al-Bashir, it was a police state. Um, very Didn't want to show that it, it did have militant cells. It, it's murky. Um, and we really don't know that much about it. But, you know, with this book, you know, Abu Husayfa does give some insights into those two aforementioned cells that he heavily criticizes. And these are two prior, you know, AQ startup groups. One was in Khartoum, one was in southern Sudan, that basically he says failed. That AQ did not do a good job of it, of trying to, you know, start these groups. And he offers solutions to correct those mistakes. And that's the point of the book. So, I mean, you're right that it's not necessarily propaganda because he's not bootlicking Al-Qaeda the entire time. You know, like, he supports them, obviously. He is part of Al-Qaeda, but at the same time, he's like, look, we failed. We messed up. Here's what we could do to fix that. And that, that's where this book comes in. And Caleb, you had, you, you had talked a little bit and you had mentioned that the, the history of Al-Qaeda post-1996 in Sudan, it's very murky. But um, you had pointed out to me in a conversation that there is some in- information in the Guantanamo Bay uh, detainee files about the uh, Al-Qaeda recruitment and operational cells in the late yeah. 90s, early 2000s. Tell us a little bit about that. Again, this paints, I always think this helps paint the, the bigger picture of, you know, you, you see some of these names. It's very, I, I just find this stuff fascinating. Yeah, I mean, this is super fascinating stuff. I mean, so there are several, uh, I mean, there are several Sudanese detainees at, at Guantanamo, um, but there are two in particular um, that, the analysts that you know debrief them or whatever talk about AQ's remnant network in Sudan post nineteen ninety six, and this is what I was mentioning earlier. Of you know they left behind recruiters, they left behind financiers, they left behind operational leaders in the case that they ever wanted to do an attack or try to do an attack on Sudan. Uh, of course, we don't know if that ever came to fruition. Probably not, but they were heavily involved in recruiting and financing still in Sudan post nineteen ninety six. Um, and the f- these two files mention that. You know, there's two individuals that AQ left behind that were pretty big deals, uh, Abu Hassam and Abu Yahya al-Sudani. Um, they were leading the AQ network in Sudan at that time. And they actually recruited two individuals um, that later wound up in Guantanamo. Um, these two individuals were recruited by al-Qaeda. They were trained in al-Qaeda's camps in Afghanistan, but they fought for LET. Pakistani terrorist group. Yeah, and when they were arrested. al-Qaeda. Yeah, they were arrested in Pakistan. They were, you know, then transferred to American custody and wound up in Guantanamo, but they were detained as LAT fighters, but they were recruited by AQ in Sudan. And this is a very common occurrence, which I'm sure a lot of our listeners are aware of, where this is put on different units, particularly in Afghanistan, Pakistan. You know, the joke about the Haqqani network is um, they're the Pakistani Taliban when they're in the Pakistani side of the border. And then since they cross into Afghanistan, they're the Afghan Taliban. Lashkari Taiba does this. They'll have leaders who go into Afghanistan and they're called Taliban because they just they just repurpose their fighters. Um, that way they give themselves plausible deniability. So I've always find that that to be a very interesting dynamic. And I that you know, Abu Hassan and Abu Yahya al-Sudani, they certainly you know, the exemplify this dynamic that exists, right. particularly Which, in Afghanistan, Pakistan. By the way, little information on those two out there. Boy, you just doing a cursory search, like it's hard to find anything on those two. More uh, unknown unknowns. Right. Where are they today? Are they still in prison? Are they, you know, are they still out there? Was the main thing? Or like, yeah, no idea. Um, but by late 1990s or 2000s, they were AQ's top people in Sudan, and they're given. Who the, the circles they were moving in? Lashkari Taiba, it's significant. I put it in the Al Qaeda sphere. Obviously, it's a, oh, its own Pakistani terrorist group supported by the Pakistani state. The head of Lashkari Taiba helped uh, Osama bin Laden, advised him in forming Al Qaeda. That's how far back these ties go. And these individuals, you know, really makes you wonder what's happening out there today. No, and I, I think this is a good segue of talking about, you know, while AQ has historically sucked. At starting, you know, quite frankly, sucked at starting a group, you know, uh, in Sudan. They've been successful recruiting Sudanese across the world. I mean, the Sudanese fighters fought in Mali. The, they were instrumental in forming AQ in, in Somalia, aka Shabab. Um, Abu Talha, Talha al Sudani, who was the leader of AQ East Africa for a while and then became a senior leader in Shabab. Um, Ibrahim al Kosi, 
who is, you know, top leader of ACAP in, in Yemen. He was also a former Guantanamo Bay detainee, but now a ACAP leader. Uh, you know, Abu Khalil al-Sudani in Afghanistan, who was a member senior, of Al-Qaeda yeah, Shura. Senior, yeah, senior AQ leader, you know, global command. Also, Bill, you have a fun fact about him that I didn't know about. Yeah, so he was killed in a U.S. Uh, raid at an Al-Qaeda camp in Paktika province in 2015 in Burma district, which is a known hub for Al-Qaeda. Um, during the raid, they uncovered – so keep in mind – a little bit of context here. Uh, I got to geek out on Afghanistan. But at the time, uh, the U.S. intelligence community for six straight years was saying there's only 50 to 100 al-Qaeda fighters in Afghanistan. And they were primarily uh, located in Kunar and Nuristan in, in northeastern Afghanistan. He was killed. An al-Qaeda, top al-Qaeda leader was killed in Paktika. Obviously, this is a Haqqani network stronghold. So he's be, being sheltered by the Haqqanis. Remember, the Haqqanis are now played significant role in the Taliban's current government. Um, during the raid, they found information that there was a large, two large training camps in a district called Shurabak in the southeast in Kandahar province. Uh, several months later, U.S. and Afghan forces raided the camp, killed somewhere between 150 and 200 al-Qaeda fighters. So it just blew away that 150 narrative confined to the northeast. And they got that information by, you know, getting Abu Khalil al Sadani. That's how important these individuals were. And Caleb, on your point, yeah, they may have trouble establishing jihad. It's not a problem, just Al Qaeda has problems in certain countries. Sometimes, you know, the soil is not fertile for them, but they're not stopping. They're, they're evaluating and they're looking for ways to improve. And one of the things, if they're successful in Kenya, in Somalia, in, and in other theaters in Africa, it gives them a little bit more juice to try and, and double down in, in difficult theaters like Sudan. No, and, and clearly that, you know, even though they can't create a, an actual cohesive group, people in Sudan are still attracted to Al-Qaeda's, you know, message. I mean, otherwise you wouldn't have so many Sudanese fighters across their branches across the world. I mean, of course, there were also Sudanese fighters in Syria. There was a, a senior leader of the current incarnation of Al-Qaeda, uh, Haras Adin, who was a Sudanese Al-Qaeda veteran also killed just within the last couple of years in Syria. I mean, these guys are everywhere, but yet they can't, they've had, historically had trouble creating a group inside Sudan. And this is, this is what he's trying to fix. Yeah. He's trying that. This is why I say it isn't propaganda. He's looking at this critically. He's looking at this as a problem solver and not as a cheerleader to pump up Al Qaeda's. That's the only way they improve their operations. If they can, if they can be self-critical and serve as a learning institution. Right. Which I, I think we should just jump right into it. Um, which, I mean, Sudani starts with the ideological. Uh, I don't want to, we're not going to talk too much about the ideological component. I think at this point, everyone's familiar with Al-Qaeda's uh, ideology and what they want. But I think the, just to summarize the important points here is that, you know, he, he now sees Sudan as a viable theater for jihad. That's what he calls it. Um, and this is largely due to recent political developments in Sudan, which I, again, I don't want to get bogged down with the details, but in a nutshell, um, the dictatorship of Omar al-Bashir was deposed in 2019. Uh, you know, quote unquote democracy comes with a new government led by this guy, Abdullah Hamdak. Hamdak was himself overthrown in a coup last year. Uh, and the country is now led by General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who overthrew Hamdak last year. So it's a military junta in Sudan that's leading the country. Al Sudani says that you know, with democracy, this is basically idolatry because you're you're supplanting God with something else. Um, but he also says a military rule will only create problems for Muslims because of all the abuses. So basically, he says that you know the time is now, and it's up to you, the Muslims, to actually defend yourself. And then from there, weighing that weighing that foundation, he provides to give everything a you know, prospective jihadists would need to get started. And literally, he provides a step-by-step -step guide. Um, even with the, the ideology, he starts with saying that, you know, Dawah, or proselytizing, essentially, to Al-Qaeda's, you know, version of Islam, is the most important step. Is you have to get the masses on your side. You have to talk to the public, saying why jihad is important, why we should do it now, and why you should support us. Uh, which, uh, typical AQ, this is what they did in Tunisia. They were you know, Dawa first in Tunisia, uh, 
in Mali, they tried to do that, but they had to, you know, they implemented harsh policies too quickly, which she also says was a mistake, by the way. Sutani says. I, I love that reporting from Rukmini Kalamaki of the New York Times, right? She goes back and talks about that. That's what's in the communications between Waheshi and Drukdal, the head of AQAP and the head of AQIM, where Waheshi's saying, hey, slow it. We, we learned this problem in Yemen. We have to. Sometimes we have to slow roll this stuff. We can't shove it down their throats. Al Qaeda had that problem in Iraq and yeah. Western Iraq as well. So, uh, you know, the, I, again, I find that stuff fascinating. Yeah. Sudan is just doubling down on, on, on those lessons, basically taking what Waheshi and others have said, you know, basically focus on Dawa first, get people to agree with you. Then you could start jihad. Um, and then in this vein, he actually gives like a literal list of talking points and buzzwords for jihadists to use when they're preaching to the masses of like literally these are the acceptable topics do not stray from those essentially is what he gives which i think is kind of interesting of like this physical guidebook of like these are the only things you should talk about anything beyond this would be too confusing it's too complicated focus on this which i think is streamlining the process for jihadis which is the whole point of this book by the way is streamlining everything it's uh, an 83 page book this is a yeah. nice manual Right. That's not too long, but detailed enough, but not so detailed as a, you know, a 500 page tome that probably won't get read. Dude, it's basically like the idiot's guide to starting jihad. It's essentially what it is. Um, but <laughs> so after Dawah, he talks about the vanguard force, which this is the whole point of AQ real large is AQ sees itself as the vanguard force for the Muslims across the world to foment these Islamic insurgencies. And that's essentially what he tells prospective jihadists in Sudan, of like, you are the vanguard. You are to show the masses what the problems are and how to solve it. Uh, you know, again, this is classic AQ. They've done this everywhere. This is what he wants them to be. And then from saying that they should be the vanguard force, he transitions to talk about the military matters, which I think is the most important aspect. One quick point on the vanguard. That is a very important term for Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda in the Khorasan, obviously Afghanistan, Pakistan region, their, the name of their propaganda outlet, vanguards of the Khorasan, right? It's, it, you'll see that name pop up in Al-Qaeda propaganda quite often. Uh, this is uh, Abu Huzaifa just, you know, going with Al-Qaeda's talking points here. Not, not just, but they, you know, it's a legitimate talking point, a talking point it believes in. Yes, I'm, uh, as you know, Caleb, I am quite fascinated by the, the military matters, but I want to make a quick point on the, on the preaching, the proselytizing. I think the individuals who, who execute this and guys like Abu Zaifa, these are the ones we should be, we really should be targeting first. These are the Al Qaeda. It's telling you this right here. We cannot transition to jihad to the military matters until we lay the foundation until we preach the our word to the people and these are the ones that give al-qaeda not just you know don't that that provide that base but they also provide then they provide the, the religious justification to carry out their military campaigns how can they justify an attack that kills civilians because they'll they'll give you a religious justification for that yep. that is that is taken so let's go let's step into no, the i mean and just a quick point on that of, of like you know of course military leaders or operational leaders are important for jihadi groups and they are very dangerous i think the the ideologues the the dawa people are are way more insidious you know, I think, Why is uh, MacDesi yeah. still breathing, Caleb? Like I, 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 I sit here and and just stunned. I, I have a loss of words. Why I still see his name pop up? Why he is commenting on things? He should be six feet under somewhere. Right. I mean, I, I personally always think of Abu Drogo in Kenya. Abu Drogo, who was you know a part of AQ East Africa. He was always part of AQ East Africa, but he was a preacher in Kenya in Mombasa. And, you know, he, he recruited so many people to Shabab, so many people to Jihad, but he wasn't an operational leader. You know, he might have had, you know, his hand in some plots, but he was largely a preacher. Preaching the message of, of Al-Qaeda, that's more insidious to me. That dude recruited untold, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of people to Jihad who carried out attacks, who carried out, you know, who killed civilians in Somalia and elsewhere. That dude's just as dangerous as an operational leader. You know, of course, he's dead now, but like, of course, he was just as important as an operational leader when he was alive. And there are so many unknown unknowns of these that are 
spread out through the or the jihadist story in both al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. These I'm not saying we shouldn't target military leaders. Oh, and by the way, often military leaders do play an important role in the preaching, in the recruiting and things of that nature. However, these individuals like Abu Huzaifa, they are they are to me the most dangerous individuals because they under they understand the big picture and they are very adept at recruiting at and proselytizing to uh, and, and their legacy outlives them. I mean, look at Anwar Awaki. Anwar Awaki is a perfect yeah. example. Though. Even Abu Drogo is still influential yeah. for yes. East African networks. Like still to this day, ten years after his, his death, people are still listening to his audio files and being used for recruitment. Like it's insane. Uh, but moving on to military, I think, which is the most important thing of this book, is because it's not just an ideological diatribe. It is, it is essentially telling any prospective jihadis in Sudan, this is what al-Qaeda expects from you. This is how we want you to be organized. This is how we want you to operate. If you don't do so, you're going to fail, essentially. Um, which I, I think, starting out just the way he orders the book of like, he gives advice on how to select an emir, of who's qualified to be an emir. Who should you pick? Why should you pick this individual? You know, think clearly about who should be, you know, weeding you. Um, which of course he, he says that, you know, they need to have political or military experience. Uh, they need to come to the fro- to the fore with an already, you know, thought out plan and, you know, plan of action for what the group should do. Um, without that, they shouldn't be an emir. Um, but he also says this of that a group will need to have a main leadership shura a military shura, and a, a religious slash ideological shura, which is exactly how AQ operates across the world. Exactly. Of uh, You have to have these three leadership councils to keep your group in check, uh, which he lays out perfectly in this book. Um, and then moving on from there, he talks about... One quick point, Caleb. And, yeah. and often members of the main shura will serve on a military council. Yeah, it's overlapping. Council. There's yeah. a lot of overlap, and that's done for specific reasons, but... It shows how Al Qaeda, the importance of the military, and the again we have a military council. Obviously, you're going to have a leadership council or the main shura, but it's not. It's military and it's ideological, and and that shows the, the you know it's it those two go hand in hand. It's extremely important for not just Al Qaeda. Islamic State is organized. Oh yeah, this is also exactly how, how YS operates, but it's. It's just important that he's literally stressing this to people of like, he's not leaving any room for imagination. He is explicitly telling them what exactly they should be doing. Um, and, and on this point, he actually tells them where to build a base of operations. I mean, this is straight up Maoist influence jihadi strategy of, you know, start in the rural, build your way into the, to the urban. Um, but on this point, he tells jihadis, you know, what to look for in a base. What, you know, how, you know, defensible is it? How visible is it? You need to consider all these things. Also, here's what you should cache. Here's what you should, you know, stockpile. But at the same time, he does talk about, you know, you need urban cells. You need to implant people in the cities to carry out, quote unquote, special operations, i.e. terrorist attacks. They're not going to call them that. But he also says there needs to be an external operations wing, which is also AQ. But he leaves that kind of vague. He doesn't, he he doesn't explicitly say those are for attacks or anything like that nature. He just says external work which could be recruiting, financing, whatever. Um, but of course, that's how jihadis operate in general. On that point, right, Caleb, how did you and I and Tom know that how we understood what was happening in Afghanistan? You, the first point you mentioned, that Maoist influenced jihadi strategy. This is exactly what the Taliban did. This is what, how I was able to build that map. And this is exactly the reason why I tracked what was happening because I understood the tel- the Taliban be- and they told us this in their interviews with their military and political leaders. I remember uh, the leader uh, in Ruzgan. He said uh, this was in I'm going to say 13, 2013 or fourteen. He came out and said, "Oh yeah, they're ceding the rural areas to us, and we'll take that, and we'll meet you in the cities." Yeah. And yet, and they st- and they did exactly what you're talking about. They created urban cells. These were the Kabul attack networks in Kabul, but not just in Kabul. It attacks happened in all the major cities where the Taliban could execute this. the The countryside was used as uh, they had training camps. They had cash weapons caches. They recruited. They taxed. They did all of those things. Again, this isn't anything new to those of us, but it's beautiful to see it spelled out in such plain, clear, and concise language. By no, and, and I have no doubt that he is probably basing some of these things on the Taliban 
Like, there's no doubt that he's not looking at that and saying, this is how we should be implementing everything worldwide. Because it works. And of course, again, it's not anything new. This is classic malice insurgency. It's been going on since 40s, 50s, 60s, whenever. So he's not rewriting anything on this point. But I think it's it's, it's important to, to note that he is literally saying, this is what you should be doing to prospective jihadis. And then giving, and by the way, on the list of things to cache, it's a whole page of this is exactly what you need to stockpile, which I think is also interesting of like, it, 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 it's literally an idiot's guide. Man, like there's there's no way to fail on this. This is um, the jihadis version of Mao's Little Red Book, right? That's a yeah. short pamphlet on how to organize your Maoist insurgency, and and I'm sure he's taking from that and taking from the lessons, not just the out the Taliban, but the lessons of. I see a lot of the lessons in that conversation between group. I just keep, I know, I keep going back to that. Yeah. And I, to me, it's one of the most fascinating documents that I or, or set of documents that I've read. Uh, that conversation between Drew Dell and and, and Nasser al Wahaji. And you, know, you see a lot of influence in this. And that doesn't make this unoriginal or ineffective. It, to me, it just builds. He's building upon a body of work of not just jihadists, but Mao and, and other. No, I mean, it's, it's very much like an introspective guidebook of like he's definitely being cautiously optimistic based on Al Qaeda's prior experiences, history, mistakes, whatever, from all across the world. Like not just, you know, Mali, Yemen, he, we're going to get into lessons from Somalia, we're going to get into lessons from Syria. I mean, he's taking where Al Qaeda has been successful and where they have failed and kind of coalescing the two into like an actual playbook. Which I, I, I think the this kind of builds into the main historical lesson that AQ has had um, of who can be killed and who can't be killed. Um, and, and this gets back to Zwahri's, you know, kind of binding document in 2013, the General Guidelines for Jihad, wherein Zwahri literally ruled out the the new rules for Al Qaeda going forward of who can be targeted and who can't. Um, and Sudani in his book literally just repeats it, like he doesn't give anything new on that regard. Um, but just to you know, to specify for people who may not be familiar, who may not remember. Basically, the general guidelines are, you know, only military, security, and political. Any direct targeting of civilians can, is not acceptable. Um, of course, AQ jihadis break that rule all the time. Shabab just broke that in Somalia, where they killed 100 plus civilians, you know, just a couple of days ago. Um, but generally speaking, that is the rule for Al Qaeda: no direct targeting of civilians. Yeah, and, and they get around this by saying. In the case of Somalia, if I recall, Caleb, they said that the the education ministry was was recruiting people to fight us. Fight, right. So they right. so they they they'll find excuses, and they're not just excuses though. They'll they'll create a religious justification. That gets back to yes. the logical. They'll create a religious justification for that. So more than likely, someone probably got a little bit too. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Aggressive in their targeting. There, Shabab will figure out a way to make an excuse for that attack. And that's exactly yeah. what they do. Which, I mean, th- that being too aggressive is, is exactly why Zwahri had those guidelines. I mean, it's, it's directly related to Zarqawi in Iraq. of uh, his excessive Reading my mind, Shias. that's exactly the point I wanted to make. I mean, Zarqawi went hard on the Shias, man. And Zwahri obviously, you know, rebuked him personally, sending a letter. Um, and Zarqawi is the problem child. The Islamic State has always been the problem child for Al-Qaeda when it was still part of the Al-Qaeda network. Obviously, the 2013 document was was based on the lessons from Iraq of we can't be that hard on civilians. But, of course, they break that all the time. Um, yeah, and I, I found that interesting, the timing of that release, obviously. That was really Zawahiri putting his stamp on al-Qaeda after the death of, of bin Laden. He wanted to be sure to put his guidelines and his visions. Not that it was all that dif- in, uh, different from what bin Laden um, and how he viewed these issues. But I've always believed that Zawahiri really needed to say, Al Qaeda is my organization, and this is how I expect things to work going forward. Yeah. Which, I mean, to be fair, like, to his credit, like, the majority of the time, like, 95% of the time, Al Qaeda across the world follows those guidelines. Like, of course, again, they kill civilians, but they'll usually justify it in, like, a religious stance to try to manipulate people into believing, you know, this is okay, or manipulate their own followers into believing it's okay. Um, but generally speaking, this is, this is what they do. Um, but and I think this is an important caveat to make, which is a caveat that Sudani makes, is that economic targets are perfectly acceptable. You know, and this is the, this was the justification behind 
of the Twin Towers were an economic target. Therefore, it's acceptable target because it harms the economy of the United States. Sudani makes the same case for Sudan. He says that any economic target that would hurt the economy of Sudan, go for it. You have carte blanche, essentially, um, which is also important for al-Qaeda. Uh, they, they also believe that. They know, and economic targeting has been you know, a staple of AQ since its inception. So, not, again, nothing new, but I think it's important to note that like, even though he did stress you know, who can and can't be targeted, he then turns around and says that, by the way, economic targets, go for it. And Caleb, that's, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. That's, they recognize the economics, the importance of the economics in holding up governments. And once those governments are weakened to a certain degree economically, that can help the recruiting and the proselytization for, for Al Qaeda. So they, th- this is an all encompassing strategy. Let's turn to how Al Qaeda, the, the, the learning from the mistakes, the main takeaways from, from this. Uh, let's get into that. Yeah, uh, you know we've said this several times uh, on this podcast here. Of, of AQ is a learning organization, uh, and shout out to Thomas Jocelyn and David Gardenstein Ross. They wrote an entire book about how jihadis are adept at organizational learning. AQ being one of the best at it, um, it, it really shows in this book. Um, Sudani, you know, he criticizes AQ's failures across the world, particularly in Sudan, but he really hammers home two. Uh, lessons that AQ has learned in Sudan. Um, and we mentioned this previously earlier of, of the cell in 2007 and the group in 2012. Um, and he talks about both of them in depth, which also gives credence to the idea that he likely had something to do with those groups. Otherwise, I'm not sure how he would have this much insider knowledge on them. Um, but either way, he basically says that the 2007 cell, which was based in Salama, which is a southern suburb of, of Khartoum, uh, it did a bombing in 2007, and then Sudanese authorities quickly rolled it up. But he says that they failed because they tried to implement the Iraqi model of jihad to Sudan too too early. The Iraqi model being, you know, a large scale, you know, uh, insurgency, uh, car bombs, bombings, you know, what have you. Um, but Sudan didn't it, it didn't have the conditions to implement that, and he chastises AQ at that time for being too early or too too hastily ready to to try to impart that in Sudan. And he says that any future jihadis in Sudan needs to recognize that, you know, without specific conditions, you can't do that. You need to base your jihad on what is actually happening in the country and then go from there. Uh, then he gives the other lesson, the 2012 group, which again was a group in southern Sudan in the Dender National Park, which that's uh, on the border of Ethiopia. So again, southern actual Sudan. Um, a large national park. There was a, a a a group down there that was definitely Al Qaeda. Um, gets given you know Sudan is speaking on it, but in 2012 they attacked a a like park guard post. Uh, I don't think anyone was killed, but they captured a large cache of weapons. This prompted the Sudanese state to crack down, and they destroyed the cell. But at the time, Sudan never said who the cell was. Um, they gave like vague. You know, notions that, you know, this was a training cell for AQ or for jihadis in in Mali and Somalia. Obviously, that was AQ. um, But with Sudani talking about it, it definitely was AQ confirmed now. Um, But regardless of that, he says that that group failed because they lacked vision. They lacked goals. Their leadership was fractured. They didn't have anything cohesive. Uh, So, again, he stresses the importance of you need all those three. If you don't have those three, you're not going to be a successful group. Yeah, an attack for an attack's sake without uh, uh, that attack fitting it into a wider strategic vision is yep. probably detrimental because it just gives the government the opportunity to crack down. I mean, essentially and you're what sort he of says. left with claiming an attack. Yeah, that's essentially what he says. He says that they attacked too soon. They didn't have anything in place for them to actually sustain anything. But yep, you know, they did it anyway, and they failed. And this is why you shouldn't repeat that mistake, which just is a little side note. Uh, there actually was a Sudanese jihadist who actually became a commander for AQ in Mali um, that was killed in 2013 that came from that camp or is believed to have come from that camp. Um, so the Sudanese were right. They were training people f- to go to Mali and Somalia. But again, just further you know, evidence that that was AQ. Um, but you know, the group failed. And Sudanese says that you know, going forward, the, the new generation of knights, which is you know, the verbatim quote of what he calls these prospective jihadis, needs to heed his advice. They need to learn from these past mistakes and then go forward. Yeah. And, you know, the message I get from him, and this is pretty obvious, but I'm going to sum it, 
build the base of your jihad. Your base isn't conducting attacks and having a strong, you know, you don't come out the gate swinging. You lay the foundation. That is through recruiting, through proselytizing, through establishing your networks. You don't, let's, don't conduct your military attack until you have all of the, the groundwork laid out. So he's basically telling the Sudanese jihadists, you, you're at square one. Work from work from there, you know, and this is a tough message, by the way, for some jihadists that that patience a lot. And I think this is what makes the Islamic State has made them uh, very appealing to a lot of what I call the, you know, red meat jihadists is they like to hit those attacks. And sometimes, you know, they act in sometimes in a rash manner. But this is why I always view as Al Qaeda as being more dangerous is that they they're willing to again, be a learning organization to evaluate what they're doing and, and understand that, look, we need to establish, we need to lay the foundation before we jump into the jihad part until we jump right. into the military operations. It's, it's oh, and, uh, really quickly, I'm going to plug uh, Tom and David's book. It's called Enemies Near and Far, uh, How Jihadist Groups Strategize, Plot and Learn. Definitely give that a read. As you know, Caleb, it's a fantastic book. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, if you want to learn how jihadis learn from their mistakes, that is the book. Yeah. On your point of building the base of jihad, it's almost like Al-Qaeda's full name is Qaeda al-Jihad, you know, the base of jihad. So it's, it's wild how that works. That's crazy. And the base isn't always a terrorist attack, a military operation. It's the ideological, it's the network of uh, the financiers and fundraisers and recruiters all of that makes up the base, not just the terrorist network. I mean, look, a lot. You know, we get accused a lot of, of focusing on the military side of it. I admit I enjoy or or, or, or fascinated by that part of the reporting. But I understand what makes Al Qaeda tick isn't just its military operations. The other parts are far more dangerous. I've, I've said, you know, again, I'm going to repeat myself here, but I've said for years, the ideologues, the head of the, uh, the Taliban, uh, Mohabi Atul Akhundzada, he's not a military leader and he never was. He was an ideological leader. His job before he was a mirror is he was the chief judge or the, he was the ideological leader for the Taliban in their shura before, um, you know, when, uh, under Mullah Mansour before he took control of the Taliban. You know, people will say, oh, he's detached or he's, you know, he doesn't have his finger and he doesn't need to. He plays his role and his import to the organization. They won. They won under him. You have to give a lot of credence to his position. But the Taliban didn't win because they had a strong military or that. They, they won because they were very effective at recruiting and, and proselytizing and, and indoctrinating uh, jihadists on both sides of the border and pulling in al- members of Al Qaeda. I, I just keep going back. It's not just the military, the import of the entire organization. The base is more than just the military. Absolutely. Uh, and I think this is a point that he's trying to impart as well, of that it's not, it's, not, it's the whole gambit here. It's not just ideological, but it's also you got to take in part the military. You have to take in part, you know, the whole point of what L- AQ is trying to be. And of course, you know, again, we don't know how successful this book is going to be. Uh, it, you know, it may turn into nothing, maybe, you know, actually instrumental. We, we don't know. Um, but it's clear that, you know, irrespective of any th- sort of, you know, immediate threat, AQ wants this book to be out there open source. They want this to be available for any would-be jihadist. They want this to be, you know, to be the rallying cry for any sort of, you know, prospective jihadi in Sudan. And I think that's the wider point and wider threat of this book. It's not necessarily, it, it's again, it gets back to AQ's long game. They, they play the long game with, with most everything. And this is what you, you were talking about with the red meat jihadis of IS of, you know, they want the immediate you know, the immediate dopamine head of doing these attacks or whatever. The, the AQ, gratification yeah, yeah. of killing people. And that's right. AQ is, is the, they, they play the long game. They are the masters of that. And this is just another example of that, of, of yeah, again, with him stressing the importance of Dawa, that could take years, but he's okay with that. AQ is okay with that. And I think this is the, the wider point of this book is like, this is exactly what AQ expects. This is what they want people, their their prospective allies, their their already you know affiliates and their branches to operate, and it's long term. Yeah, I, I have no doubt that this book is not just intended for a Sudanese jihadist audience. Oh, it's definitely out there. It's focused on Sudan, but it's definitely it's written in Arabic, so obviously there's going to be wider application. But it, it's it's it, it's not just for Sudan; it's for everyone. But he's specifically calling for jihad in Sudan. 
so look, the communications are going back to Drupal and, and Waheshi, right? That those were internal documents. You know, correct me if I'm wrong, Caleb, but I think this is the first time I've seen a public uh, analysis of Al Qaeda's network. Am I am I missing something by Al Qaeda itself? I don't know. It's possible, but this this one really piqued my curiosity. I, I've seen the beats of this book in various places, but I think this is the first time where I really saw them put it all together. And this is why I believe that this isn't just intended for the Sudanese. Right. I mean, I it's, don't think it's, it's for all of Al Qaeda's leadership and branches to internalize and say, how does this apply to me? Am right. I doing this right? I mean, it might be the first book by Al Qaeda that kind of compiled everything or all of the arguments, all the lessons into one. Um, Abu Huzaifa wrote a previous book, I believe in 2019, maybe even 2018, again, published by Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, but it was about Al Qaeda in Mali. And basically, he also talks about the lessons learned from 2012. But that was focused on Mali. So this may be the only book where they take all the lessons and put them in the one. But again, I'm not sure it could be wrong. Please correct me, anyone, if I'm wrong. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you if we, if we got that one wrong. Caleb, anything else to add to this fasc- fascinating conversation? I really appreciate you coming on. No, I, I think I think we had all the main points. I think the, just to summarize of, of this is an open source book that AQ is intending for Sudan. They want Jihad to start in their former host, but it could be, you know, it, it, applicability is, is wide ranging. And also, Abu Huzaifa is a perfect example of someone that we didn't really know previously, now playing an outsized role in Al-Qaeda's messaging. Yep. Is an unknown unknown or relative unknown unknown who's now known to us. That's part of our bread and butter, Caleb, right? Looking at these guys, see where they fit in the organization and their the importance. I, I really think we've identified uh, a key Al-Qaeda leader going forward. We pretend, you know, there's a lot of discussion, legacy Al-Qaeda leaders, right? I discussed that at the open. And well, if we could just eliminate them, Al-Qaeda's done. Well, they're not. Here's an individual who has risen to prominence. Just because he's not a household name in the counterterrorism field doesn't mean he isn't important to the group. Actually, yes, this is this is a point I want to make. Of everyone talks about quote unquote core Al Qaeda or what constitutes the 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 old generation of Al Qaeda. By any metric, this dude is part of that. There's yes, no absolutely. way he's not. So it's just another example of how many of those people are still out there that we don't know about. And here's one of them that we really didn't know anything about. And here he is in the last couple of years writing tons of books for ACAP, yet he has this long pedigree going back to you know the, the mid-90s, even being alongside bin Laden in Afghanistan, performing a, a, a terrorist attack in Saudi Arabia in the early 2001. But any metric, he's a quote-unquote core al-Qaeda member. Yeah, he just wasn't a household name. I challenge people to name me a, um, on September 11th, name me a U.S. political leader, a cabinet member of the Bush administration or a general who is still serving in the U S government today or the U S military today. The answer to that is zero. None of them are. They've Al Qaeda doesn't retire. They don't get a cushy job on a board. They either die in a combat operation or counterterrorism operation or they die of old age. Abu Huzaifa is probably what he's probably been involved in jihad for at least four decades now, 30 plus years. He's still got he's still got some life left in him. Hopefully not much. But if the, even if, this was the point I made about Zawahiri when he was killed, it only took us 21 years after 9-11 to get him. And he was involved in jihad from, from the 1980s. That's that that's another aspect of this core. And don't we can't pretend that there aren't individuals in the wings waiting to replace these guys who have been haven't been great. It's Habu Huzaifa, important top level Al Qaeda leader. You could bet that he has five deputies below him that have been learning under him and have been waiting to, I'm not saying waiting and you know, scheming to take his place, but, but they're, they're aware that when he goes, they'll fill his shoes. Right. Let's assume that he is part of whatever AQ's current network in Sudan looks like. He's got to be one of the top guys. He's got to be one of the main officials there. He's going he's gonna to have deputies. I don't even know if he's in Sudan, but if he is, like he's clearly part of that network or their attempts at building some sort of network. Absolutely. Look, we saw this with the bin Laden documents. I think it was Abu Tia Libby, um, where they talk about Al Qaeda, the general manager position for Al Qaeda. He had two deputies and this and he had that. And you start looking and you're like, whoa, uh, he has an entire staff under him. Some of the individuals we saw that were listed on that staff or that we knew became members of his staff. 
where individuals Al Qaeda pointed out in fitness reports in early, like I want to say it was around 2005, right? Where Al Qaeda is doing evaluations. You know, just because that guy might have been a low level Al Qaeda lieutenant in 2005, we're 17 years beyond that, folks. They rise up the ranks just like captains rise up in the ranks to become colonels and generals today, or, you know, congressmen might become a member of cabinet or a president. Caleb, thank you again for joining us. I've got to get you back on very soon. Uh, All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for today's episode of Generation Jihad. Just a reminder, you can find us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you listen to podcasts. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a review, preferably a positive one. Thanks again, and we'll see you again soon.